Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to the New Books in History podcast, part of the New Books Network. I'm your host, Christopher Dinitz, and today our guest is John Jeffries Martin. Professor Martin is a historian of early modern Europe at Duke University. He specializes in social, cultural, and intellectual history of Italy in the 16th and 17th century. He's the author of Venice's Hidden Enemies, Italian Heretics in a Renaissance City, 1993, which won the Herbert Baxter Adams Prize of the American Historical Association. Also, Myths of Renaissance Individualism, 2004, and his most recent book, A Beautiful Ending, The Apocalyptic Imagination and the Making of the Modern World, published this year, 2022, from Yale University Press. This is the book we are talking about today. He's also the author of some 50 articles and essays, several of which I got to read as a graduate student myself a few years ago, as well as the 2007 edited volume, The Renaissance World. Welcome, Professor Martin. Thank you, Christoph. I'm happy to be here. Very happy to be here. Thank you so much. This book came from a history of early modern Europe, from Columbus to the French Revolution, and it feels that way too. It connects the dots between actors and events that define the early modern period. First, Columbus himself, who recently had a holiday but just lost it, uh, Gutenberg, Luther, Thomas Hobbes, Henri of Navarre, Michel de Montaigne. Um, and the book will be a delight to the specialist, who can, but it can just as easily be an introduction for the casual reader or for the undergraduate student, except that you have overlaid this familiar narrative with the apocalypse and you've added the comparative lens of Jewish and Muslim history, something we don't always get. Why did you do this, and what does it show us? Well, it's a great question, and I I honestly think that the book grew out of a frustration I had in teaching early modern European history, because most of the presentations of early modern Europe, most of the textbooks, that is, tend to segregate religion out, for example, in their chapters on the Reformation, Mm -hmm. something separate from politics, something separate from social or family life, something separate from commerce. And I think the apocalypse, thinking about the way people were thinking about the end of history, gave me a way to enter in to the ways in which I saw religion permeating all aspects of life in the early modern world. That, that was really the, the primary motivation for this. In terms of bringing in uh, Islam and Judaism, as well as Christianity, that grew out of a sense that Europe uh, is too often told, the story of Europe is too often told through a purely Christian-centered lens. And while Christianity was the dominant religion by far in Europe in the early modern period. It was not the only faith in Europe in the early modern period. And I wanted to provide a more comprehensive way of thinking about religion and society, the way these different faith traditions thought about the end of the world, what the implications of thinking about the end of the world were for developments that took place in the 16th and 17th centuries. And then what's the connection between apocalypse and modernity? You you call the apocalypse a stamp of modernity. Well, I yes, I do. I, I, I say at one point in the book that um, modernity is an apocalyptic project. And I you know, it could be authors are inclined to do this, it could be an exaggeration, but I think it's I think it's helpful to think about modernity in this way. Traditionally, of course, we've thought of modernity as a rational, secularizing, liberating process. And that that kind of narrative, which continues to be, you know, very, very prominent. One thinks of uh, the success of uh, Stephen Greenblatt's book, The Swerve, with its secularizing story of the recovery of Lucretius and how that ultimately drives out religious faith and how that is an instrument of modernization, I found I find this general idea, not just Greenblatt's, but I find it relatively unsatisfactory. And I think that part of this is that I am a citizen of the United States, which remains a deeply religious society, which has continued to have um, ideas about the end times as a prominent feature of many aspects of certain pockets of religion in American culture. But I also found the idea of the apocalyptic as modernizing in the sense that 
the way we think in the West and in the Mediterranean in general about the end of history did in the early modern period and continues down to the present to shape many of the ways we act in the world. And, and that's really what I mean by modernity is an apocalyptic project. It's not so rational as we might have formerly thought. Um, it's Our modernity itself is full of contradictions, irrationalities, and, and, and forms of faith, even if they're not explicitly religious faith, but forms of faith that make us act in the world in such a way that can be both beneficial and also quite frightening and damaging. Yeah, um... There's I, I want to have a half formed uh, idea that came to me just now as you're speaking. Um, and that's something about, you know, Lucretius and, and the, 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 the ancients of the classical period. Like they had a very different relationship with their gods who are sort of these, you know, polytheistic uh, gods who resembled humans with all their failings. And, and then we often think of the medieval person as somebody who is, you know, s- steeped in religion the way a fish finds himself in water. And so it's hard to like it's epistemologically impossible to be an atheist in the Middle Ages. Some people have argued. Um, do you think that that has remained into the modern period, even though today we all might be a little more cynical about it, and we, you know, we might consider ourselves secular atheists, but we're still we're still wet with that water of of that tradition? I, I I don't think I don't think it's the same as this idea that you suggest about the Middle Ages, which which could be true or not true. I'm not certain about that, but I I do think that yes. I mean, many scholars have looked at. Um, the development of atheism in 17th century, 18th century, 19th century, and it, it's a very problematic topic. But I do think their atheism is is not quite the same. But I I think that um, I think that as humans, we end up placing our faith in something. For example, we might place our faith in the political sphere, believe it's possible to bring about a better world through our political activism and our our voting and our intensity of trying to transform society. Or we might put it in the technological sphere that we might believe that we can solve the problem of global climate change through some kind of odd invention that will come in the future. So we continue to act upon faith, but that faith could be entirely secular without positing uh, a, a, the existence of a god. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, we're definitely going to talk about that in a minute when we get to Thomas More. But I want to start with where you begin, which is the Pillars of Hercules, uh, which was at first a boundary and then became a breaking of boundaries. Would you tell us a bit about this gateway to the Atlantic that went from net plus ultra to plus yes. ultra and what it meant for the Greeks and what it meant for the you know 16th century um, Habsburg Spain and and is is this why Columbus styled himself Admiral of the Ocean Sea? <laughs> it's, it's a great question. And I, yeah. so I had um, encountered uh, the Pillars of Hercules as a question of scholarship uh, when I studied the frontispiece to Francis Bacon's mm-hmm. Instauratio Magna published in London in 1620. And he uses it as an emblem for his own project, which is one of scientific discovery. And he uses it as an emblem of passing beyond the boundaries. And Bacon, in his writings, writes about the Pillars of Hercules. And this actually inspired me so much and got me so curious that I had to go see the Pillars of Hercules for myself. Of course, there are no Pillars of Hercules, but there is the Rock of Gibraltar in the south of Spain, and there is the... um, there's a, a, a Mount Moses in the northern part of Morocco that many people believe constituted the kind of uh, geographical elements that made people imagine that there was a gateway between the Atlantic Ocean and the and the Mediterranean Sea. And it's if one looks at kind of ancient Greek and Roman views of the Mediterranean, although people did sail through the uh, gates of Hercules into the Atlantic, there was always a kind of sense that the Atlantic was a forbidding place and that civilization, the civilization of the Greeks and the Romans and also the North Africans, was combined, confined really to uh, the Mediterranean. And and throughout the Middle Ages and through much of the Renaissance, uh, 
antiquity, the antiquity that one spoke of, the world that one knew and tried to discover was the ancient world. Um, people looked for similarities and differences to their own society through the study of writers like Livy and Tacitus and so on. In the, in the 16th century, because of Columbus and because of this encounter with new societies and a new world, um, there was a sense that the Pillars of Hercules were becoming an opening, a portal onto a much broader world and a different reality. And this is very significant because it suggests that um, in terms of the formation of knowledge, that now a person seeking to understand the world not only traveled back in time to ancient texts and read them as Machiavelli did in his studio outside of Florence when he was writing The Prince, one also traveled literally to other continents, to India, to China, to uh, the Near East, to Africa, to the Americas, encountered those peoples, those uh, the nature in, in those places, the pharmaceuticals in those places, and, and, and even how the heavens looked in those places. And that began to add to what one could know about the world. So it was, I think the Pillars of Hercules, when people wrote about the Pillars of Hercules or illustrated them or talked about them in the early modern world, I think it was a way in which they were often saying, we are modern. We are now going beyond the Pillars of Hercules. So, um, so as Francis Bacon, who, you know, maybe is, I don't know if the father, but certainly a father of the scientific method is relying on empirical evidence to prove whether yes. something is true or not, you know, where, yes. how, how does rotting meat create or not create maggots or whatever it was he was, he was investigating. So do the explorers who cross the Atlantic now use epistem, uh, sorry, um, empirical evidence to make their own theories rather than the received wisdom of the, of the ancients. Is that the is that the principle of like crossing that barrier? Well, I, I, I think it's I think it's obviously very nuanced. I think in yeah. general that's the case because many of the missionaries and merchants and explorers who came to parts of the world that they had not been to before had no rigorous empirical method at all. Mm -hmm. But but many did, right? And 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 so so what one sees, I mean, Bacon is developing a new methodology of scientific induction, which is very important in terms of the development of the scientific method. But, but other people were also exploring and making sense of the world in, in new ways. So, for example, uh, in Venice, uh, which I've studied a great deal, the pharmacists in Venice were able to obtain new plants, which they then investigated in their shops in Venice and also in the botanical garden that was developed in the mid-16th century at the University of Padua. So medicinals were analyzed in new ways, not always according to a Baconian method, but to new ways of approaching the study of medicines, experimenting with them, and learning the uses which they might have. So all across uh, the Mediterranean and Europe in this period, there were new forms of things that were known that led to a transition in not only what one could know, but also a sense of how much more one could come to know. Yeah. And um, I, I'm sure you know this uh, story. I remember reading it in the writings of the Jesuit Jose de Acosta, who first traveled toward the equator. And he, the received wisdom from Aristotle was that nobody could be in the torrid zone without combusting. And he was like, actually, it's quite lovely here. And so he, exactly. he laughed at Aristotle. Yeah. About Acosta. Absolutely. Yeah. Acosta is a great example because Acosta was very uh, uh, much a natural philosopher who studied you know, the flora and the fauna of the new world as well as the peoples and thought a great deal about what the implications of the history, a natural history of the new world would mean for our understanding of human beings and of the world itself. Okay. Um, and then the Admiral of the Ocean Sea bit, this is just my own curiosity because I've always understood the ocean as something that was impassable, kind of a, a river that goes around the ancient world like a snake eating his own tail. And the sea is something you could cross back and forth like the Mediterranean. Is that does that that language means we couldn't pass it, but now it's just another bridge to a new a new world? Yeah, I, the, this, the, certainly the ocean. You're right, encircled the inhabited world 
um, in the imaginary of, of the Middle Ages. And once there is Columbus's voyage, um, that transforms the meaning of the ocean dramatically. There's, there's no question about that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's go to your uh, previous point about voting and climate change and how we are trying to create our own um, perfect world. And you make a strong argument for the triumph of modernity and how it depends on where we stand. Uh, This is on page eight. And the triumph of capitalism and secularism and above all, the creation of democratic institutions as yardsticks. It seems very true, especially um, when uh, the week before last, Putin staged his referendum in pockets of the Ukraine where his soldiers could force people to vote. It was an ironic display, I thought, but it also illustrates your point. Um, But I want to ask the opposite. Is Western technology and reason the instruments that brought many people around the globe into subjugation, or are they rather the source of people's freedom? And I'm thinking of the abolition of slavery, of Gandhi's arguments against the British Empire to be arguments of that reason. Yeah, so, so, I mean, so, for example, I I, I think that I mean, one of the interesting things about abolitionism in the United States is that many of the abolitionists were Christians who were post-millennialists, who believed that if they could create a better society on earth, then Jesus would come. Hmm. So so it's, abolitionism doesn't only grow out of reason. I, I, I think that I don't want to discount the importance of reason as a element of modernization, but other elements like post-millennialism in the case of the abolitionists were were also important. And and also one thing I try to get at in the book, and this is of course always impossible for a historian to get at in a satisfactory way, is that when I'm writing about a beautiful ending, the, the title of the book could ultimately be misleading. I do mean that people desired a beautiful ending, that they hoped for a better world. But what they hoped for could at times be things that we would find not good at all. And their hopes for a beautiful ending could lead to clashes and conflict and exploitation and imperialism and so on. So so what I'm trying to get at is the kind of energies, the, the way in which the dream of a beautiful ending animates activity, but it also sets up conflict. It sets up conflicts between Catholics and Lutherans in the 16th century. It sets up conflicts among Christians, among Catholics and Huguenots or Calvinists in France in the 16th century that lead to military conflicts, death on the battlefield, massacres, and horrible things. So as we look towards the end, we have to realize that our efforts to change the world are going to clash with other groups and their efforts to change the world. And so the search for a beautiful ending might bring about things that are very good, but it might inevitably also lead us to conflict. That is, that is a remarkable point. And because it, it, to me, it's confusing that we are doing the opposite things at the same time, almost marching in two directions. One is like, we wish for the apocalypse where the, this world will be destroyed and the new Jerusalem will appear and we can all march together you know, into into the next place. But on the other hand, we're trying to build God's kingdom here on earth, whether it's abolishing slavery or repairing the environment or, um, you know, perfecting what we already have. And we're doing we're doing the opposite at the same time. And then at the same time, you know, cynical and disingenuous people can claim those things like and Putin, of course, saying he's, you know, fighting for democracy, even as he's doing the exact opposite, can just, you know, can use those words to manipulate us into some unfortunate, violent end. Exactly. And, and I, I think that, I mean, there, there's a sense, of, I have a sense of tragedy about that, that, you know, we, the, the hold of the desire for a, for a utopian uh, experience for humanity, uh, whether that's a secular desire or a, a desire rooted in a particular religious tradition, um, that desire is a large part of what makes us human, that we want something to be, we want to be hopeful. We want the world to be better than it is. Some people might have a very narrow sense of that. Uh, other people might have a very expansive sense of that that's very welcoming of all kinds of traditions. But the, the problem is that our hopes are always rooted in a particular place and based on a particular historical tradition, and they are going to bump into other ideas about 
what makes for a good world, and that inevitably leads to conflict. Yeah, and they're probably all happening at the same time, where you might go off to fight the Lutherans or fight the Catholics out of a devout desire to do God's will, but some, you know, um, some monarch might be manipulating you to, uh, you know, some um, a mercenary ends of his own, right? And so very often we had uh, people who were um, confessional enemies allying together for their own local ends, like the king of Spain fighting the king of France. Though so they're both Catholics, they're happy to ally with either the Persians or the Turks to, exactly. to, to suit their purposes. Exactly. And, and that's a really interesting point. And I, I also think, I mean, for example, I um, uh, one th- what, another thing I try to do in the book, which, which was something I wasn't anticipating, but as I worked more on the material, I, I came to believe it was at least persuasive, is to show that the religious turmoil of the 16th and 17th century, so from the outbreak of the Reformation through, say, the outbreak and end of the Thirty Years' War, uh, was in fact driven by you know theological debates, and and I, I think those the theologies behind those debates are, are extraordinarily important. But I don't think, at a popular level, that the reason that Catholics were killing Huguenots was because of technical issues regarding transubstantiation. Yeah. I think it was that Catholics came to see the Huguenots as polluting their society and interfering with their vision of the end. And the Huguenots conversely saw the Catholics as interfering with their vision of the end, that it was apocalypticism more than theology that led to the violence of the 16th and 17th century. And then that's also interesting that apocalypticism is something you could bring about. And I'd, I'd not heard that before, right? That I thought it was just, it's just going to come. You, you can try through some, you know, um, a deep study of astrology to predict the day or something, or, or, you know, um, looking at the scripture through, through numerological lenses and things like that. But you didn't, you're saying, no, these people thought they could bring it about. Yeah. And, and, and my favorite illustration of that in the book is Christopher Columbus, uh-huh. uh, who's a deeply apocalyptic figure. And he's moved by uh, language from the Gospel of Matthew, in which Jesus tells his disciples the end will come when the good news of the kingdom has been proclaimed throughout the world. And so Columbus sees himself as bringing the gospel, he thinks, originally to Cathay, to the Khan of China, um, he sees himself as helping fulfill that prophecy in order to accelerate the end of time. And Bacon is doing very much the same thing in the Isteratio Magna, because he is saying that he, he, he will fulfill a prophecy in the book of Daniel that as people move back and forth between parts of the world, which they're beginning to do as they cross through the Pillars of Hercules, but more significantly, as knowledge is increased, that the end will come. And so both of them are inspired by this idea that there's a role for human beings in bringing about the end. Yeah. Would you talk a bit more about Columbus, because he's such a strange man. And the more I read about him, the more puzzled I become. Um, he, I know that by this, his fourth voyage, he was dressing in Franciscan robes and yes. getting quite mystical. But, you know, er, early on, he also, um, I mean, he really wanted to have his contract fulfilled and get his 10% or whatever it was if yes. he reached Asia. Um, but he also believed that he was uh, at paradise at the very eastern end and when he passed by the Orinoco River he thought it was you know the fresh waters of the of the four rivers in the books of Genesis and and things like that um, do you want to tell the story a little bit well Columbus is an incredibly uh, fascinating uh, figure historically um, he, he he's an autodidact uh, Italian uh, born near Genoa we don't know precisely where Um grows up in Genoa, is sailing through the Mediterranean as a teenager, um, begins to sail uh, out of Lisbon, where he lived for a while with his brother, into the Atlantic, into the, Az- to the Azores. Uh, and and he, he becomes very knowledgeable. He also sails to the west coast of Africa and, and as far north as Ireland. He becomes very knowledgeable of the Atlantic. He also, and this was astonishing to me, he also was extremely scholarly and deeply read. 
and he read many languages, in, including Latin, which is quite extraordinary since he must have largely taught himself Latin. And he he read a lot of works that were both uh, astrological and religious and uh, ge- geographical. Uh, he was particularly influenced by a early 14th century prelate uh, by the name of Pierre Dailly, who had written a famous collection of works published under the title Image of the World. And that was really what inspired him to believe that there was a short voyage to be made between the west coast of Spain and the east coast of China. And that's the voyage he eventually convinces uh, Ferdinand and Isabel to fund for him. He he goes with uh, perhaps quite optimistic ideas about this voyage, but over time, as he, you know, he, he comes across on the first voyage as we have a journal. It was edited by uh, Bartolome de las Casas. He comes across as not a particularly uh, pleasant person because he's immediately thinking about enslaving uh, the peoples he encounters in the Caribbean. He does indeed enslave several of them to bring them back to Spain on his first voyage. Many of them die on that voyage. Um, but he he's a complicated person. He 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 um, his apocalypticism, I think, is really important because it leads him to these more hopeful moments about Christianizing the world. That was his hope uh, to these quite violent moments uh, where he sort of lays the foundations for much of the violence that will take place in the new world on the part of uh, Europeans in the 16th century. Yeah. Um, yeah. I also uh, enjoy your discussion of world emperors and Charles V and Suleiman the Magnificent, uh, Suleiman II. I knew about them, but I did not know about Timur or Tamerlane, whom yes. Ibn Khaldun saw in the stars, the will of heaven. Um, and that was a really good uh, chapter for me because it was brand new. Well, you want to um, talk about these fellows? I, I, I would want to add that I've also read elsewhere that there was a Russian Tsar who thought of himself as a world emperor as well. Um, so this was a, there are a lot of world emperors at the moment. <laughs> you know, yeah. So, I mean, Erasmus, uh, at one point when both uh, Charles and Suleiman are ruling, makes the wry observation that there's not room in the sky for two suns. <laughs> and I, I, I think Erasmus is right. That was, that was the problem. And I became fascinated by this story because traditionally, and I think this traditional story remains really important, and it's it's a difficult story in a way to wrap our, our minds around, but the Mediterranean in the 16th century was dominated by two empires, the Habsburg Empire in Spain and the, uh, the Ottoman Empire in uh, Turkey and the Near East. And, and this, this fact shapes really much of the history of the Mediterranean in this period. Really, it, it, it dominates the politics, the international relations of the sea in this period. And, and both of these empires um, have many, many things in common in terms of technologies, bureaucracies, uh, you know, palace rulers from the top capi in Istanbul to the Escorial outside of Madrid. And, and this, this, this tension underneath it, at a, at a really incredible level, are these popular beliefs that these emperors are playing a role through their development of empire in bringing about the end times. And, and this absolutely amazed me. So, so Ibn Khaldun, who is this brilliant uh, jurist and historian, and really some people say sociologist, uh, who is living for a while in Andalusia and then in North Africa and then in other parts of, uh, of the Mediterranean, um, he, he becomes one of the great scholars of the uh, messianic movements associated with the Mahdi in Islam in this period. And, and his writings about these movements, I think, are, are, remain compelling. These were often mass uh, political movements that could threaten existing dynasties. And there's this anecdote that he encounters uh, Timur uh, and and they have this conversation and 
it's in this conversation is absolutely fascinating because his encounter, I'm trying to remember the dates, but his encounter with Timur is almost contemporaneous with uh, Pierre Dailly's uh, work on astrology. Both huh. of them, both uh, Timur, Dailly, and even Ibn Khaldun are reading the same uh, Islamic prophecies about the future. So you, you have both Christians and Muslims informed by similar prophetic teachings. This is also something that fascinated me in this work is that, and Columbus also makes this point, in a way, prophecy, if prophecy doesn't necessarily belong to one religious faith. Hmm. Prophecies can kind of move from one faith to the other. They, there's this kind of issue of transmission. It would make a great topic uh, for a dissertation. And probably it's already been done. <laughs> I, I became fascinated by this, this the, the instances in which prophecies jet, migrate from one, one place to another. Yeah. So, so in any case, uh, Ibn Khaldun sees Timur as this major transitional figure who had been prophesied to becoming uh, a great ruler. And, and these ideas that, that are developed by Ibn Khaldun will become part of a tradition that will also influence Ottoman emperors later on. Um, do you now does this transmission happen through Spain where where the Moors had taken it for so many centuries or is it coming from the east? How is it that they have the same prophecies? Well, for example, I'll give you an example. It's, it's tantalizing more than saying that it's not that they have the same prophecy or tradition access to the but, same but tradition. For example, yeah. and I, I, this is in the book as well, but there's a uh, there's a everybody. A lot of people are familiar with Joachim of Fiore, mm -hmm. uh, early 13th century uh, abbot in Calabria in the south of Italy, who develops a sort of Trinitarian view of time. And it's an extraordinarily important idea because it sort of sets up a typology that will be influential even down to the present day. And that is that there are three epochs of history. There was an age of the father, then Jesus is born, and then there's the age of the son, and then Joachim calculates that a little bit after his own lifetime, will be instituted the age of the Holy Spirit. And the age of the Holy Spirit will be the utopia which we all hope for. Um, but another Franciscan, or uh, Joachim was not a Franciscan, but, but a Franciscan in France in the 14th century, uh, John of Rupesiza, um, develops a much more radical view of these particular ideas. And so he develops these prophecies about events, what they mean, how the world is going to soon be transformed. And many people read his prophecies later on. Well, there's a Dutch scholar, um, Gerald Wiggers, I think is his name, who has shown that there are Muslim texts written in Arabic that actually are trans direct translations of um, John of Rupesiza's prophecy. So that's an example of this form of transmission. Of course, the what one is predicting is not the return of Jesus Christ, but rather the coming of the Mahdi or the Muslim Messiah. But there are all of these homologies that are taking place among the different faiths. Yeah, that is extremely interesting. And this idea that Charles might be the world emperor is something that happens a lot in the writings of, of that time. And in, in my own work, I kept finding it because I would, my, my dissertation was about the court of Charles V in the 1520s. And there's all these people, uh, Renaissance humanists, who have come to yeah. give him a speech. And it's all about how he's going to unite the flock and gather the Christians and lead a crusade and, um, you know, retake the Holy Land and end this destructive conflict and bring order to the Mediterranean, like that, or rather the world, which is how they they thought of it. Yeah. And I think there was great sincerity. Um, and it makes me think of all the people right now who are like, let's do this and that for climate change. But whatever, the more dramatic and expensive it is, the more hesitant anyone is to upend everything we have going on. And and yet, I really think Charles put his money where his mouth is. And he invaded North Africa a couple of times. And yes. he spent a lot, yes. of, a lot of money and a lot of, you know, political capital making it happen. Do you do you feel that sincerity? And do you think it's also true of Suleiman the Magnificent or not so much? Well, you know, I it, it is a really interesting question about sincerity. That's a topic I worked on in an earlier period of my life. And and I, I'm not sure that it's possible to um, use it as an analytical category for a, a ruler. However, 
Um, I, I would say that for Suleiman and for Charles, the religious language that legitimated many of their activities, they took very seriously. They, they found it legitimating. They, they felt they were doing the work of God. And, and that's important for us to understand. And, and that, that it, it, when it enters the political sphere at the level of an emperor is enormously consequential. Um, but as you were speaking, I was thinking, you know, even current ideas about the world and uh, peace on earth are related to notions of empire. And they may not draw explicitly on apocalypticism, but they draw on the idea that if only we can unite people under this common ideology, everything will be okay. Of course, we have more than one ideology. That's the problem. Yeah, that's the problem. Why don't those morons over there just agree with me? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's really interesting, too, because empire today is a dirty word. Uh, we have erased all the empires from the surface of the earth. And if somebody does something we don't like, we call it imperialistic. But it, but 500 years ago, it was not. And often imperium was, you know, the holy authority, whereas dominium was sort of the uh, imposing, un yeah. unwelcome version. Do you yeah, want to I, talk about that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I, I mean, I think the um, history of empire is absolutely fascinating. And it's, you know, it's a very... Uh, it's a current topic among many, many scholars today who work on empire in different time periods and uh, throughout throughout history from from the ancient world through through the present. Um, I think that what I was really interested in is I, I've gotten very interested in the question of what was empire. And I don't think there's an easy answer to that in the 16th century. For example, um, if you lived in in a city outside of Venice, but under the dominion, the dominium of Venice, um, you were technically part of the empire. You worked with legal codes that were informed by traditions that were continent wide, not purely Venetian or Italian. And your freedoms, to a large degree, were secured by your existence within this imperial frame. And so the Holy Roman Empire uh, was not so much an, uh, a system that in which the emperor dominated communities, but more of a system in which communities were able to function within that particular framework. What interested me was the way in which uh, this growth of Spanish power uh, in the 16th century and into the 17th century transforms into the idea of a colonial and a world empire. And that fundamentally changes the notion of empire. And so when people talk about empire in the 16th and 17th century, I think it's really important to understand the particular position they occupied in relationship to imperial projects at that time. That is such an interesting and important point, which um, that this this idea is, you said, a shared framework that we can all agree on so we know what we're talking about. It makes me, I, I'm going to do something that might be anachronistic, but do you think that is what um, the queen who just passed and long live the king, that she was able to do where Britain no longer controls people, but her face was on the money in Canada and in the Caribbean and all over the place. And yet she was not ruling anybody but this commonwealth of nations could agree that which way is up and which way is down the way the original imperium was a baton handed to some roman general that he could carry for a moment and then when he returned from his campaign he had to return it to the senate i think if i've got that right yeah, yeah. um I, I that's an interesting analogy to the queen i i'm not i'm not i don't know enough about the commonwealth to answer that with any any yeah. clarity now fair enough um, <laughs> but, but I, I would say that i think I do think that there are certain uh, frameworks that develop within international relations that make the world function well. Yeah. And we're, we're witnessing a period of history in which many of those frameworks are being, being disrupted or undergoing transition. And that's part of why things are so uncomfortable for so many people right now. Yeah, I think that's 
that's that's absolutely right. Um, would you comment on the Muslim eschatology and how it compares with Christian and with Jewish ideas? Because that's something I knew nothing about when I picked up your book, and you say a lot about it. Well, it, it, it's an extraordinarily complex topic, and I read as much as I could <laughs> to try to understand it. But, but again, this is also quite interesting because Islam the development of Islam is deeply shaped by both Jewish and Christian traditions. And so from the very beginning, there are deep similarities uh, among these three uh, faiths that we often refer to as Abrahamic faiths. Mm -hmm. Um, in In terms of the eschatology, one of the things that's interesting is while there may, there are some surah or some verses of the Quran that are, um, eschatological, that dream of a kind of uh, wonderful inn with flowing rivers and comfortable cushions and shady trees. Um, the eschatology of Islam develops after the death of the prophet Muhammad um, and is reflected in the collection of sayings of the prophet known as the Hadith, which are both, which are, are large, numerous. Uh, Some of them are thought to be spurious, some to be genuine. Um, And in those, we find this idea that there will be some kind of messianic rescue of humanity. And this is developed uh, differently among the Shia and the Sunni. And, um, but the, the way in which it's developed despite their differences, there is an underlying similarity that at the end of time, uh, a Messiah will come back. Uh, There are different interpretations of who this Messiah will be between the Sunni and the Shia. And at the end of time, uh, the prophet Jesus, not the not the God Jesus, but the, the Son of God Jesus, but the prophet Jesus will also return with, um, with the, with the Mahdi or the Muslim Messiah. And, and these ideas were uh, widespread. I, I, you know, I found evidence of them. I didn't find, but I discovered evidence of them in, in Morocco, uh, where they were extremely important in, in Egypt, uh, in Persia, in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and and they, they took on a variety of forms. Um, and so it's difficult to uh, point to their precise uh, theologies without doing a different kind of study than I did. But but I, what, I, what I was fascinated by was not the differences, but the deep similarities in the way in which in each of these faiths, people would long for an end where human society would be greatly improved. And how about, how about um, the Jewish view of the apocalypse? Well, that's, that's also fascinating to me. And much of that has to do with the idea that the Jewish people will be gathered again in Israel, that they will have um, regained their nationhood, um, and that this will lay the foundations not for the return of anyone, but for the coming of a Messiah. And and so I, I see deep homologies there as well. It's, it, it, you know, I focus on messianic Jews in this period, but I I think there's a lot of evidence in the Talmud and other writings that many Jews were comfortable with waiting, that they were not deeply messianic. I would also say that's true among Christians and Muslims as well. I don't want to make a claim that everybody uh, was, you know, waking up each morning hoping for the end of the world. I don't don't believe that. But but I, I do think that among Jews, there was perhaps a less intense messianism possibly because the Jews had no empire uh, and the Muslims and the Christians did. That's a very good point. Yes. Yeah, so it's a, it really remains in the field of personal practice of your carrying out your more, own religion. More in the field yeah. of personal. I mean, I think, I think synagogues could talk about this or other rabbis could talk about this with uh, their congregation, but I, I don't think it was uh, quite as intense as it was among Christians or Muslims. Yeah. Yeah. Would you like to comment on um, Protestant ideas, especially of Christ and Antichrist, which is one of your chapters, the tension between yeah, Protestant? Well, yeah. The Protestant material is extraordinarily yeah. <laughs> complex. I, I keep pointing to the fact that everything is complex. And what does a historian do but simplify <laughs> the complex and therefore, you know, make a fool of himself? Um, <laughs> the Protestant. So, yeah. So yeah. I, I write 
you know, a good bit both about Martin Luther and John Calvin. Um, Calvin is a bit easier because Calvin is a figure who um, is quite insistent that it's impossible to know the end times. He envisions an end, but he envisions an end in which each individual Christian, you know, meets his or her savior um, in a kind of flash. And there is no political action that leads to this particular end. Luther, on the other hand, seems more conflicted by this. And I, I was interested in Luther's um, idea of the Antichrist. And the Antichrist, of course, um, was often uh, in the late Middle Ages envisioned as a kind of anthropomorphic, uh, you know, Antichrist who would destroy all the good things about Christianity. In Luther's vision, and this is really fascinating, the Antichrist, he begins to see the Antichrist not as an individual, but as a construction that he associates largely with the papacy. And so Mm -hmm. it's institutions and teachings, not an individual that constitutes the Antichrist. Of course, on a popular level, people continue to think of the Antichrist as a kind of Antichrist who would be anthropomorphic and and individual. So Luther, Luther is interested in the Antichrist. Luther is not uh, a millenarian thinker at all. In fact, he's deeply opposed to millenarianism. Yet in his writings, one senses a kind of sense of trauma, which he shares with the uh, apocalyptic thinkers, that human beings are engaged in this struggle And this struggle will be consequential in shaping both the German reaction to the papacy and the German reaction to the Turks, Hmm. both of whom they saw as antichrist. Yes. And then you've already talked about how much blood was spilled uh, between those. A lot lot of blood was spilled. And and this is the um, the you know, this is the paradox of a beautiful ending is that it, it 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 may drive many of the. Uh, developments that lead to outcomes that we would celebrate as accomplishments. At the same time, it 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 can lead to bloodshed and and really horrific violence. Yeah, um, can you bring us uh, through from this time to the present? And I'd like to start with uh, Thomas More and Utopia. You talk sure. a lot about this famous tract, which many of us remember from college, about Utopia or no place and how. Uh, Thomas More, who himself was a very deeply religious man and, and a martyr, you know, in King Henry's mm. court and so on. But he envisioned sort of this perfect society. And then lots of people th- sort of through the early modern, late modern and up to today envisioned a perfect society. Is this all apocalyptic thinking? No. Uh, OK, so th- this is a great question because I do talk about more and I talk about other writers of of utopian uh society, other other writers who write about what they envision as a utopian society, Tommaso Campanella, for example, in his City of the Sun, and Francis Bacon in his New Atlantis. The, this idea is not always necessarily explicitly apocalyptic, but I do think that the envisioning of utopia was shaped either directly or indirectly by the apocalyptic tenor of the times in which people began to write their utopias. And this is more explicit in Campanella than it is in Moore or in Bacon. Um, And it's part of, you know, utopia is part of this dream of creating a a perfect society. And that that dream, you know, pulsates through uh, the Enlightenment, the 19th century and and down down to our own time where people dream about what would constitute the the perfect society it as as something that is increasingly a modern notion of utopia um it is not as explicitly religious i would come back to this point that people can be Mm -hmm. perfectly atheistic and hope for a better world and a beautiful ending but they're putting their faith in the transition of technology or the transition or the transformation of technology or the transformation of the way we organize our societies. And is that always doomed <laughs> because we are, we are very flawed engineers. And, uh, you know, every time you start to set the year to zero, terrible things happen, whether it's in the terror after the French revolution or the, you know, the Soviet experiment or the cultural revolution in China, that sort of thing. 
Yeah, I, you know, to say always is, is always difficult. Um, but I, I, I think that we, we need to be humble as human beings. And, and um, of course, we are not. And by the we, I mean, particularly people who have great political power are often not humble. And, and that can lead to follies that are dangerous in the world, um, even, even with the best of intentions. Uh, so I, I, you know, I think it's important for all of us to think about what would make a better world and, and to work for a better world, but in a, in a very humble way, because um, if one is not humble, one is likely to end up harming more people than helping people. Yeah. Um, well, that is a really good place to stop for the moment. And I just first I want to say thank you very much for talking with me on New Books in History. But I want to tell our listeners we're doing something unusual because I'd like to invite um, our listeners to a second conversation, which you and I are recording, which will be more about the cultural history of the apocalypse, which will be published on Almost Good Catholics, uh, uh, another podcast, and I'll provide the link below. But it's less about the history, more about philosophy and the cultural history of apocalypse. But before we go, may I ask what you're doing next? As I understand it, you are you are next going to work on the on a history of the torture of torture in Italy. Is that correct? Well, I'm I have to I, I'm working on a history of a, a particular jurist who wrote about torture in the mid mid 16th century. Um, I have to say that it's the hardest topic I've ever worked on in my life because I don't have the background in legal history or the history of rhetoric that I really would need to understand his writings. I've been struggling with his writings. I've just finished an article on a curious dialogue that he published. But I'm also more optimistically thinking of working and have begun working on uh, ideas of providence in the 18th century among Enlightenment thinkers and the development of the idea of progress. So this is something that I'm more energized by. Yeah, I find that really important because uh, I, I find it's really hard to understand violence in the early modern period. And I really tried, especially talking about the Spanish Empire in Mexico, because so many people come from a violent Europe and they carry it with them to the new world. And we, I think, you know, and rightly we condemn them, but from their point of view, they weren't, they weren't doing anything that they wouldn't have done to each other first. I don't know. Do you think that's a valid um, contextualization? I, I don't know. I mean that that I mean there there is this idea, right, that the Reconquista ends in 1492. Columbus discovers yes. yeah. the new world or encounters the new world, and the violence uh, Hidalgos end up going to that world and carrying their European violence with them to that world. Of course, it was already a violent world, the new world. Yeah. Um, and 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 so you had two peoples with traditions of violence who were encountering each other. Uh, and maybe spurring spurring each other on, um, and so I think I think that's a really complicated complicated issue. I don't think that the you know Europeans who were massacring people uh, thought that they were doing the right thing. I think they were greedy and looking for gold. Yeah, that's true too. Because Cortez writes in his letters. Um, that he's so sorry to have to destroy this beautiful city, but he's going to do it anyway, which is a deeply abusive thing to write. Like, I'm so sorry you're forcing me to destroy your exactly. city. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And maybe it's, it's big societies, you know, like if you if you land on a, on a Caribbean island of Arawak people, they don't, there's just not that much there, so they're not going to do awful things. But you come across an empire in Mexico, and guess what? They're sacrificing people by the tens of thousands with obsidian knives on top of a pyramid. Is it is it our collectivization that makes us awful, or is this too much speculation on my part? I, I you know, it's it's worth exploring. I think it's a bit speculative, but it's certainly yeah. worth exploring. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's stop there. Okay. Well, this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Professor Martin. I enjoyed it.